So I'm going to be talking about mitochondria, uh, their physiology, and talking about the path from understanding mitochondria to therapeutics. It's probably worth emphasizing that bipolar disorder is at its core an energy disorder. Too much energy in mania, not enough in depression. And there's now, apart from mitochondrial dysfunction, which is generally referred to as low energy, uh, as we've been talking about it, bipolar disorder is unique because in the manic phase, there's actually increased energy generation. From the earlier studies by Baxter and others using PET scanning, we know that in bipolar disorder, you just burn energy in the manic phase. And it's unique, there's no other disorder that does this as far as I'm, I, I know. Now, we have hypothesized that bipolar disorder is essentially a disorder of regulatory failure. So it's clear that prior to illness break, you have normal mitochondrial functioning. In the manic phase, you have increased energy generation, it's decreased in the depressive phase. It's a failure of regulation. The problem is we don't know what the key regulatory failure is, but a lot of energy is going into trying to understand that. We also know that all the mechanistic pathways, both in terms of risk factors and in terms of biological elements, converge on the mitochondria. And almost every biological risk factors and all the lifestyle and social risk factors converge on mitochondrial functioning. The important thing about mitochondria is that they're potentially druggable, they're treatable, and there are many different drugs that we know have the potential to increase mitochondrial functioning. So we've been interested in looking at different agents that might boost mitochondrial functioning, and our target has largely been the depressive phase, because drugs that suppress mitochondrial functioning, like Cyprexa, we know are quite effective for the treatment of mania. Our big problem is how we fix depression. So we've been looking at things like coenzyme Q2, alpha lipoic acid, NS-L-cysteine. We've done many studies of NS-L-cysteine. And we thought that it's unlikely that we're going to come up with a major boost to mitochondrial function with a single agent. So we decided to do a study where we combined these things. So we did a study where we added NS-L-cysteine, ubiquinone, alpha lipoic acid, plus a whole lot of cofactors. This ran for four months with a one-month follow-up. And what we found was not terrible, but not wonderful either. So at the end of the 16-week endpoint, there was no benefit of therapy. But at one month post-discontinuation, the mitochondrial cocktail group was significantly better than the control group. As I said, not the answer to the problem, but enough in there to make us excited that mitochondria are potentially targetable. Let me step back a little bit and tell you a little bit about our team's blue sky vision for what we're trying to achieve. So we go back to the piece of research that Kyra did many moons ago, where she looked at what are patient priorities. And essentially, the number one patient priority, she had five, four of them pertain to better therapeutics, more tolerable therapeutics. So we are focused singularly on coming up with better treatments for people with psychiatric disorders. And what we use in our team is we look at stem cell models for discovery, we validate them using epidemiology and animal models, and then we move to large-scale clinical trials which allows us to disseminate our findings and translate them. So let me tell you a little bit about our stem cell model. So we try and work out, because we haven't got a pathophysiology of bipolar disorder, nobody's got a molecule which we can target with a single drug. So what we do is we try and reverse engineer what a cocktail of very different bipolar medicines do. So we take a cocktail of mechanistically different drugs and we want to find out what the net metabolic transcriptomic effect of all different drugs is. So we take lithium, quetiapine, valproate, lamotrigine, very different drugs. We look at their effect on gene expression. We do Bayesian analyses. And we come up with what we call a gene expression signature. So we then validate this two ways. We validate this looking at human white blood cells. And we got white cells from Marion Leboya in Paris. And we also looked at rats given the same cocktail, and yes, that gene expression signature holds up. We then go to drug screening. So then we go to compound libraries, and we look at available off-label drugs to see what does the same as known bipolar medicines to transcriptomics, to messenger RNA. We're also looking at proteomics as well, but we're looking across the omic platforms. Now, the critical thing is you have to have the right model. We started off looking at off-the-shelf neuronal NT2 cells, we very quickly learned the error of our ways, and we're now using patient-derived stem cells which we transform into organoids. Uh, we also use lithium responders and lithium non-responder organoids because we want to see the difference. And 
Additionally, we're trying to look at what impact drugs have that we can shift the omic profile of people with the illness towards the omic profile of control. So what drugs do that? So, as I said, we take, we take stem cells from people with bipolar disorder, we grow pluripotent stem cells, we differentiate them into cortical networks, and I want to emphasize the choice of model is critical for screening. And this allows us to come up with a whole lot of hits. Now, our hits are very... I'll just share with you a couple of the hits. The first thing is that we come up with what I think of as positive controls. So these are drugs that we already know work for the disorder. Risperidone is an example. So of the thousands of drugs we screen, we come up with a number of drugs like risperidone. But the most interesting one that I found was trimetazidine. Now, trimetazidine is not available in the USA. It's available in Europe. It's available in Asia. But it's a heart failure drug. But it's a mitochondrial drug. Now, trimetazidine does what the ketogenic diet does. So previous speakers have said that in bipolar disorder, you have this shift from aerobic to glycolytic energy generation. Just, a, just an aside, the first study showing this was published in 1934, showing increased lactate and decreased pH, which is essentially, these are disorders of glycolytic energy generation. We've known this for 100 years. So essentially, trimetazidine is a fatty acid beta oxidation inhibitor, and what it does is it shifts energy generation to, from glycolytic to aerobic. And in heart failure, it increases the efficiency of myocardial cells. It does penetrate the brain. So we've done some preclinical models in our study. We took the standard tests, the four swim test, and you can see a reduction of in immobility, the elevated plus maze, which is a test for anxiety, and it reduces anxiety in this model. The sucrose preference test, and you can see it increases sucrose preference. And so, using the standard preclinical models that suggest efficacy, trimetazidine goes ping. And we've been able to commence a clinical trial which we're calling TIDE. So it's the, effect, uh, the efficacy of adjunctive trimetazidine in bipolar depression. And for us, this is just the start of looking at mitochondrial therapeutics, because once you have a druggable target, you then have the ability to, to refine this and to look at this in concert. Let me just mention other mitochondrial strategies, because the reality is that mitochondria are addressable by a variety of things. So I'm going to go back to our clinical trial of the mitochondrial cocktail. And one of the, we found two things when we looked at post hoc analysis. Number one, in the group of people who exercised, as you can see this on the right-hand side of the figure, they had by far the most robust benefit from the cocktail. If you look at the people who ate a healthy diet compared to people who ate a junk food diet, they also had a benefit from the mitochondrial cocktail. So the take-home message from our data is that you can target mitochondria through diet, you can target it through exercise, and you can target it through cold. So cold is a really interesting way. What we know is that cold showers, cold baths, cold swims increase brown adipose tissue activation, increased mitochondrial energy generation. And I have a couple of patients with bipolar disorder whose disorders have stabilized by having morning swims in the Southern Ocean, which is flippin' freezing. Uh, and since they've started doing this, their bipolar disorder is normalized. So the ketogenic diet is one mitochondrial strategy, and it's one that we've written about and we believe is a very important potential therapy, but it's not alone. Cold water exposure, physical activity, and we now think that we have some druggable targets for mitochondrial therapeutics. So our idea is that the whole area of mitochondrial therapeutics is an exploding one. It's hugely promising for the therapy, not only of bipolar disorder, but for many other psychiatric disorders. So let me just finish off by saying, what the hell do we need to move the field forward? How do we take these bitty little things and take them to scale? I had the privilege of being involved in a study called ASPRI, which is a very large aspirin study for the treatment and prevention of flipping everything. It cost $75 million. It definitively showed that aspirin did not prevent cardiovascular disease. On the basis of that study, the whole field of cardiologists said, right, we're stopping using it. And the message is, if you have enough large-scale, rigorous, incontrovertible, methodologically bulletproof, highly powered studies, the field has to change their behavior. Where are we in mental health? We're fragmented, we're small-scale, we're balkanized. 
Everybody's doing their own bitty little methodologically crappy studies, and nobody believes them, nor should they, right? So what we have to do is we have to learn from what the cardiologists are doing, what the intensive care people are doing, what the endocrinologists are doing. We need to unite as a field, come together, decide what our critical challenges are, and all pile behind that and say, we are going to do the definitive study on you know what, to ensure that when we produce this paper, which has thousands of patients in it, and it's published in the New England Journal, nobody can ignore that message and practice has to change. Because unless we do trials like the cardiologists, we're never gonna change the field. We're never gonna change clinician behavior. That's what we need to do. Now, an important point that I've emphasized is that in terms of the resources required, discovery platforms in the scheme of things are relatively cheap. Epidemiology and animal studies are relatively cheap. Clinical trials are bloody expensive. So the resources that we need to totally change and transform the field have to go into clinical trials, because it's only clinical trials that are ever going to change clinician behavior. So what we're doing is in Australia, we've created MAGNET, which is the Mental Health Australia General Trials Network. We've been able to get all psychiatrists, psychologists, mental health people behind a singular initiative to do large-scale, high-quality studies in Australia. We're only just beginning this initiative, but I believe that this is what has happened in other fields and we need this to do. And I'm, forgive me for being a little bit expansive here, but we need what I'm calling BrightNet, which is the Bipolar International Clinical Trials Network. We need a network of experts where we get the best, most experienced trialists, the best ideas, the best basic scientists who are gonna inform the development of these ideas, the best methodologists, the best data scientists, we come together and we create a network of expertise so that we can do the kind of trials that are going to change clinician behavior. Thank you.